The title of my message, if you're taking notes this morning, is I agree. We got a person next to you say, I agree. Now, I don't, I don't know if any of you are like me, but I've had problems where I've agreed to something that I don't agree with. Anybody, anybody in here ever agree to something that you don't agree with? Like, for example, just the other day, this happened just the other day. My wife's like, she's going to go out and she's going to run some errands and she's going to do all these different things. And I'm trying to watch the news, right? Or watch something. I don't know what it was. It was probably the Food Network or something, right? And so I'm watching something and I hear my wife and she's saying stuff like, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> and, and then she asks me that question. She's like, you hear me? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I got you. I got you. She's like, you got me. You sure? You got me. Yes, I got you. See, what, you don't, what I didn't understand in that moment is I absolutely heard nothing she said, but I agreed to all of it. <laughs> now, the problem with agreeing to all of it is when she came home, she expected for it all to be done. But the problem is I didn't truly agree with what I was agreeing with. And in our life, isn't it interesting how we sometimes do that with God? God has all these promises. He has all these amazing things. But yet we don't know what it truly is to come into agreement with God. And you know, this morning, my passion is, my hope, is that when you leave this place, you will leave here with saying, in 2020, I'm going to come into agreement with God's yes. My goal in 2020 is to come into agreement with God. How many of you here want to be in agreement with God? What are you coming into agreement with? Who are you believing? Huh? Are you believing that God is able to do what he said he could do? And what's incredible about this passage is, number one, Paul, is he's, he's writing a second letter to the church in Corinth. He has to deal with a certain fallacy. Let me explain to you what I'm talking about. The fallacy that tribulation and hardships are a reflection of your spiritual state. The fallacy that Paul is dealing with is that tribulations and hardships are a reflection of your spiritual state. So that means there's this false theology that if I'm going through persecution, if I'm going through hardships, it's because there's sin in my life or something's wrong with me. Or I'm outside of the will of God. But what Paul is ensuring his people is that he's saying, listen, guys, I face persecution and hardship all the time. It's a part of doing something great for Jesus. Hardships, persecution, tribulations are a part of doing something great for Jesus because the enemy doesn't want you to succeed. The world doesn't want us to succeed. And so we're going to be fighting. We're going to be facing hardship all the time. So if you have an incorrect theology, which Paul found it necessary to encourage the church to make sure they have the right perspective, because it's easy for us to get discouraged. When you're facing hardship and all of a sudden, you know, you're facing this hardship, you go, oh, well, obviously I must be out of the will of God because this is hard. Can I tell you sometimes the measure of difficulty reveals that you're smack dab in the middle of God's will. <laughs> Can I just say that? We have to be very careful that we don't allow our surroundings to dictate and determine the position of our life. Just because you're going through hardships doesn't necessarily mean that you're not in God's will. Paul was aware that if we have an incorrect perspective, we can allow the presence of hardship to cause us to abandon the promises of God. Friends, many of us will be pressed on every side. Scriptures even say, I've been pressed but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. It is by the grace of God that we function. But we cannot allow what's around us to determine our position. We have to determine our position not on circumstances but rather relationships. The position of your life cannot be determined by the circumstances that surround you. It has to be determined by the relationship you have with God. See, this is the one thing I can do. I can't count on the circumstances in my life to be just right in the will of God. The only thing that I can count on in fulfilling God's will and God's yes in my life is to make sure that my relationship with him is strong and secure. That is what it's all about. 
So be careful not to get derailed because things don't line up exactly with how you think they need to be. We talked about that last week. This is kind of like that that reoccurring theme that God's taking us into as we travel into 2020. God wants us to make sure that we have the right perspective so that we're not abandoning his promises or being derailed in the midst of hardship, but that we can persevere. See, friends, if you, if you automatically think that when you face hardship, God's against you or you're not in God's will, what'll happen is you'll step out and you'll say, you know what, God, obviously you're not in this and you miss God. But you see, if you're close with him, if you got a relationship with him, if you're making sure that your confirmation is not your situation, but him, then it doesn't matter what's happening around you. All hell could be breaking loose around you in your marriage and in your finances, but you can have confidence that you're in the will of God because you're connected with him. Can I get an amen? So Paul wants to make sure we stay connected. We're not assuming our position based upon our circumstance, but our relationship. But the second thing that Paul does, and this is phenomenal to me, is he says all the promises of God are yes in Christ Jesus. They're what? Yes. Yes. That means they've been done. That means that all of God's promises are not being resisted, or he's not rejecting us. He's not saying no. Not happening. Anybody in here ever get a no? You know what I'm talking about? My son wants something really bad. He's like, Dad, Dad, can I have this? No, son. No. But daddy, but daddy, but daddy, but daddy, but daddy. No. Have you ever met somebody that any any conversation you have with them, any interaction you have with them, it's a no? Can I get an amen? Paul wants us to know that our interaction with God and the promises of God and the access to the promises of God and the receiving of the promises of God are yes in Christ Jesus. That means God doesn't withhold from you. That means God doesn't reject you. That means God doesn't go against his promises that when they are fulfilled, when they are established, I should say, when they are established, they are fulfilled. I'll say that again. When they are established, they are fulfilled. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparable great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rulers and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. Why is this important? Because in this passage, it reveals that the reason God's promises are yes is because they're established in Christ. Everything that Jesus did on the cross, everything that Jesus did in the grave, where he now he has power over death, hell, and the grave, was established, and that means that now we have access to the promises of God. Every promise, every promise written in this word right here, you have access to, not because of your own strength, not because of your own merit, but because of what Christ did for us. He established God's promises. Jesus, through his death and his resurrection, gave you the yes. Gave you the go ahead. (laughs) Let me give you an example. What What does God say yes to? There's so many things that God says yes to, but just to encourage you this morning, let me point out a few things that God says yes to. His yes is that God accepts you, not rejects you. I'll say that again. His yes is that God accepts you, not rejects you. How many of you guys are happy that God didn't reject you, that he accepts you? Listen to this. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 says this. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. 
And ready for this? This is amazing. Everybody say, my yes is in Christ. <clears throat> Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Mm. That means you're accepted, not rejected. Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. God has accepted. See, his yes is yes you. His yes is I receive you. Have you ever knocked on someone's door and they opened the door and then they saw who it was and they're like, bye-bye, and slammed the door in your face? Anybody here had a door slammed in your face before? Obviously, you've never visited in East Oahu. Anyways. <laughs> Hi, I'm Pastor Josh Morocco from King's <laughs> I love Jesus. <laughs> No one here has ever faced rejection. I think any, every single one of us at one time of our life, we've faced rejection. But God says, because of Christ, you are accepted. You're accepted. Yes, I accept you. How about this one? Yes to his supply. Mm. Anybody in here need some supply? Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 says this, and my God shall supply all your needs according to his what? Riches in Christ Jesus. Man, that means Jesus became, gave you access to supernatural supply. My God shall supply all my needs. You know what all my needs in the Greek means? All your needs. <laughs> Not like pick and choose and be like, I think that one, that one, God's like, no, too much. All your needs, your spiritual needs, your emotional needs, your physical needs, your financial needs. My God shall supply all my needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. How about this one? Yes to healing. Anybody in here need some healing? Come on, yes to healing. Isaiah 53, this is one of my favorite passages in all of scripture. Isaiah 53, 4. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. That means that God says yes to your healing. God says yes to your supply. God says yes to your desires and your needs. God says yes to accepting you and receiving you because of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? I think right now we just need to take a praise break and give him some praise that he deserves. Wow. See, if we could get a revelation of God's yes, the greatest thing that we can get in 2020 is a revelation of God's yes. And what God is saying yes to you concerning your needs and your issues and your problems and your pains, your suffering, your desires. You know, unfortunately, and let me just kind of deal with this for a second. Unfortunately, because we have a misconception of the nature and the character of God, we actually think that it's wrong to desire certain things. We think that God is actually waiting because, you know, God wants to whip us into action. You know what I mean? He's just like, no. He wants to teach us a lesson. And so we think that because God's this mean, angry God that chooses to resist us or reject us, that God doesn't actually want to give us that which we desire. You know the problem about that? The problem with that is this. If that's the perception that you have of God, you'll never go to him for your need. You'll never go to him for your desire. And you'll think that certain things that you desire, certain, certain things that you need are off limits. But you see, God wants you to bring all your needs to him. All your prayers and your petitions to him. All your desires to him because he wants to be your supply. He wants to be your source. You know what God wants to do right here? You know what Paul says? Is God desires to say, yes. All of his promises are yes in Christ. Wow. 
How do we respond to God's yes? And I think that's a big deal. Because you can have a revelation of God's yes, but if you don't know how to respond to God's yes, you'll never see the fulfillment of what God wants to do in and through you. So how do we respond? And, and Paul makes it very clear that through him, the amen is spoken by us. I'll say that again. In him or through him, the amen is spoken by who? By us. That means we say amen. What does amen mean? In the original Greek, it actually means this. Let it be or I agree. This is so cool. When the people say amen to God's promises, they're saying, Lord, let it be done in my life. But in order for that to happen, you have to come into agreement. There's something that has to take place in your heart to believe that all of God's promises are yes. And so now the amen that is spoken through me is me saying, Lord, I come into agreement with everything you promised. There's a faith within me that says, I believe that that which you promise is true. I believe that that which you have established is for me. But if you can't agree with his yes, then you'll never walk in the fullness of it. What is Paul saying? Paul's saying, you've got to amen God's yes. It's time to amen God's yes. God's already said the yes. He's waiting for our amen. For us to come into agreement. For us to say, Lord, I agree that you are a God that heals. Lord, I agree that you're a God that delivers. Lord, I agree that you're a God that supplies. Lord, I agree that you're a God that fulfills. Come on. In Hebrews chapter 4, I love this. Mm. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2. For indeed we have had good news preached to us. Just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. Think about this passage. The writer of Hebrews says something so unusual. It says, God spoke the word, the word came forth, but there is a disconnect because even though they heard it by faith, by their limited faith, They could not receive what they heard, and so it hindered them from walking and receiving what God had for them. Friends, there are moments in our life that we can hear something, but if it's filtered through our unbelief or filtered through our fears, filtered through our doubt, what begins to happen is God can speak truth and life till he's blue in the face. But if we don't have the faith to receive it, we never connect with what he's saying, which leaves us incapable of receiving what he's giving. What is Paul telling us in 2 Corinthians? He says, look, we have to agree. We have to amen. God's yes. We have to say, I agree. That means I align my life with your promises, Lord. I align my life with your promises. Our agreement with God is substantiated in faith. Our agreement with God is substantiated in faith. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 says this, but the righteous will live by his faith. We have to live by faith, not merely by sight. In order to receive the promises of God, to take hold of it, we've got to have faith. Ed Cole says something so powerful. I love this. All you have is the word. Life's greatest failure is not your sin, but in failure to read the word. The only way the word can wash your mind is when you read it. You know, a lot, I'm just being real. Um, a lot of us, we want to we wanna get freedom and find hope and find abundance through osmosis. We'll stick the Bible right then. Or we'll just, we're holding, I, I hold the Bible close. It's fine. I love the fact that you hold the Bible close, but it's got to be in you. 
Do not simply be hearers of the word and so deceive yourselves. Be doers also. But what Ed Cole says is he says, man, every time you get in the Bible and you read this word, what you're doing is you're actually washing your thinking with the word. Every time you come to church, that's right, I said church. Anytime you come to church, guess what you're doing? You're washing your mind with the word. And what does that do? It changes your position. What does it do? It puts an amen in you. Come on, every time you open up your Bible and you read, you're putting an amen in you so you can respond to his yes. Every time you come to church, you're getting an amen in you so you can respond to his yes. Man, we need to get in the word. Coming into agreement with God. We've got to come into agreement with his yes. you got to believe his promises. So you can take hold of it. Do you believe that God can heal? Do you believe that God can deliver? Yes. Come on, do you believe that God can make a way even when there seems to be no way? Yes. So that if you believe it, then you gotta shout an amen. Yes. And in your heart, you gotta say, I receive what God is doing and I'm gonna declare amen. Even in those moments where I'm facing storms, when I'm facing hardships, I'm going to say amen. Say, Lord, I agree. I agree with your word. I agree with your promises. The last thing that Paul puts an emphasis on is he says <clears throat> that all the promises of God are yes in Christ Jesus. He tells us that through him, the amen is spoken by us, that our job is to come into alignment. God's job is already done. He already established the yes. Now our job is to take hold of the yes by declaring amen. I agree in my heart and in my actions. We have to live out our amen. The last thing is Paul puts an emphasis on God's nature. This is incredible. The importance of relationship. What is Paul emphasizing? He's emphasizing the importance of relationship. The closer you get to God, the clearer his nature and plan appears. The closer you get to God, the clearer his nature and plans appear. It is impossible to be in agreement with that which you do not know. It is impossible to be in agreement with that which you do not know. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17 says this, I keep asking that the God of your Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. Did you hear that? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may what? Know him better. It's about relationship. So if you know not the character and the nature of God, you know not his promises. And if you know not his promises, guess what? You can't say amen to him. So your ability to take hold of the promises of God and receive everything that he has for you is dependent upon your relationship with him. Paul puts an emphasis on understanding our interaction with the Godhead. The complete revelation of his person, the Trinity. He puts it all right there. It's amazing. We actually see the picture of the complete God, the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Many people say, well, Pastor, Trinity, you can't find Trinity in the Bible anywhere. That's, that's true. The word Trinity is not there. But we see it clearly. This is actually one of the things that we see clearly. It's this. The definition of the Trinity by Tertullian says this. Within the substance of the one God, there are three distinct persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Can I say that one more time? So that you have a correct theology of the Holy Spirit. It's this. Within the substance of the one God, there are three distinct persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. 
Pastor, why is this so important? Why did Paul find it necessary in his letter to the church in Corinth to make a distinction of all three parts of the Godhead? And I believe it's this, because if we're going to take hold of the promises of God, there has to be a certainty in our life. There has to be a part of our hearts and our life and our thinking that is convinced that God is able, that God is true to his word, that God is unshakable. And what we see is this, when he mentions God and the Godhead, it is the certainty given to us by God. That means that this, that the certainty of the promises of God are not dependent upon us, are not dependent upon our situations or having every situation perfect. The reason why Paul found it essential to give us a picture of the Godhead is because he says it is dependent upon God's nature. That God is unshakable. That God is unchanging. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. That he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. That God's not going to give up. He ain't going to quit. He ain't going to stop. That he looks at, at, at our situations from a different perspective because he's God. He's not bound to our situation, our problem. He's not bound to time. And so he had to paint, he had to paint a picture of the certainty given by God. Imagine for a moment if you got a promise from someone that every time they gave you a promise, they fulfilled it. You'd have no problem believing that promise, would you? But imagine on the other end, if someone came up to you that never, ever fulfilled one of their promises, lied to you, stole from you. If they gave you a promise, would you believe it? You'd be a glutton for punishment if you did. What is Paul saying? That there's a certainty of the very nature of God. He is unchanging. He is unchanging. He will not change. Come on, I said it again. He will not change. So, so Paul needed to under, have us understand if we're going to take hold of the promises of God, we have to be convinced of the certainty of God's nature. But I also love this, the centrality founded in Christ. Why is that so important? It's because the assurance that Christ is and Christ has done what he said he was going to do. Come on, people. Everybody with me. That Christ is positioned to do the work that was necessary. So without Christ, it's just like anybody ever been on a seesaw? Right? Anybody here ever been on a seesaw? Anybody here ever had that one friend? You know what I'm about to say. That one friend that they're like, man, let's go in the seesaw. You're like, yeah, let's go in the seesaw. It's going to be fun. And you already knew that in the middle of that ride, he's going to jump off and you're going to get hurt. You Anybody know what I'm talking about? You're going to fall. I had that one friend. One day I taught him a lesson. He never did that to me again. But you know, it's, it's just like Christ and the, the role of Christ within the promise is he's like that pivot point. That all the promises hinge on the reality of Christ. If Christ did not die, if he did not rise, Paul says that our faith is futile. Christ becomes that pivot point that all of our promises hinge upon. That if Christ is real, that means every promise is real. So not only is God faithful, not not only is he the substance, knowing that the promises will not change, but the promises now hinge upon Christ. That because of the reality of Christ, that is a proven fact, a man named Jesus, that claimed to be the Messiah of the world, that claimed to be the King of kings and Lord of lords, that said that no one comes to the Father except through me, lived 2,000 years ago, died on a cruel, rugged cross, and three days later rose from the grave. They can't find him. Archaeologists, after archaeologists has tried to find his bones, they can't find Jesus. Can I tell you why? He's not dead. He's alive. And every promise we have hinges upon the reality that Christ is the risen, resurrected Savior and he is seated at the right hand of the Father and he's standing in the gap for you. Man, when you understand, when you get a, I'm sorry, I'm excited. When you get a revelation of who Jesus is, that he is seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you, you get that revelation alone. You have no problem praying for healing. 
you have no problem believing God for big things. You want to know why? Because the reason the scripture portrays Christ as being seated at the right hand of the Father is because it's a position of authority and power. That means that Christ standing in the gap for us, as long as he is still in that position, his name still carries authority and power. That's why we can cast out demons in the name of Jesus. That's why we can lay hands on the sick and see them recover in the name of Jesus. Then anything we ask for in faith believing, it shall be done. Anybody coming in agreement, in my name, it shall be done. Everything hinges on Christ. He is the center point of this. And Paul understands this. The very reason he's giving us the picture of the nature and the character of God is that God is the certainty. Christ is the centrality. But thirdly, I love this. The certification is established by the Holy Spirit. He's that seal. He's that stamp of the reality of Christ. He is the certification. He is the anointed one. He is the one that does the work. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 says this, for who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God, no one knows except the spirit of God. Now we have not received not the spirit. Now what we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. Ready for this? So that we may know the things freely given to us by God. The Holy Spirit reveals every part, the validity, the reality of the promise. The Holy Spirit's the one that reveals it to us. So friends, can I just tell you right now, it is imperative for you to step into 2020, not in your own strength, not in your own power, but in the spirit of the Lord. Because it is the spirit of God that reveals the promises of God to us. It is the spirit of God that allows us, even in our weakness, to take hold of every promise from God. He reveals it to us. He makes it possible C.S. Lewis, and I want to read this to you. This is a very unusual understanding of mere Christianity. C.S. Lewis writes this, and, and I, I want you to see this. What I mean is this. An ordinary, simple Christian kneels down to say his prayers. He is trying to get in touch with God. But if he is a Christian, he knows that what is prompting him to pray is also God. God. So to speak inside him. But he also knows that all his real knowledge of God comes through Christ. The man who was God. That Christ is standing beside him, helping him to pray. Praying for him. You see what is happening? God is the thing to which he is praying. The goal he is trying to reach. God is also the thing inside him which is pushing him on. The motive, power. God is also the road or bridge along which he is being pushed to that goal. So that the whole threefold life of the three personal being is actually going on in that ordinary little bedroom where an ordinary man is saying, Ordinary prayers. What does that mean to us today? God has given us all his promises. All his promises are yes and amen in Christ. And all we need to do is come into agreement. The problem is in our own strength, in our own understanding, we are incapable of fully taking hold of all the promises of God if it not for the Spirit. We desperately need the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Friends, in 2020, you need to pray in the Holy Spirit like you've never prayed before. Come on, somebody. You, I mean, you just need to know what it is to pray in tongues. Oh, pastor, but that's weird in the church. You know the problem is? Because we've deemed pre- speaking in tongues weird in the church, we've raised up a powerless generation. I'm telling you. The book of Jude says, build yourself up in the most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. It is an essential discipline. Praying in the Holy Spirit is an essential discipline in having power in our lives in Christ Jesus. And actually taking hold and having the faith that is necessary to take hold of the promises of God. You need to pray like you've never prayed before. How much more? The Bible says, how much more will he give us his spirit if we but ask? We need the Holy Spirit. The reason why Paul puts such an emphasis on the nature and the character of God is because he realizes that his promises, God's promises are not detached from him. They're not something that was just spoken 2,000 years ago and we just got to grab it and reach up and grab it. No, no, no. It it doesn't come from just simply reaching up and grabbing it. It comes from attaching to God. Attaching to him. Saying, God, I'm going to be in relationship with you because everything that I need, everything, all the supernatural power I need, all the breakthrough I'm believing you for comes through my relationship with you and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, Jesus, our Savior, was so convinced of this that when it came time for him to ascend into heaven, he instructed his disciples. He already told his disciples, you have my name. You have my authority. He already told his disciples, greater things will you do than I ever did. But then he said, however, don't do anything until you're filled with power of the Holy Spirit. All his promises are yes. And in us is the amen. But we need his power this year. Friends, in 2020, will you say amen to God's yes? Come on, this year, will you say amen to God's yes? I don't, I don't know what's hindering you. Maybe, maybe there's a lot of uncertainty. Maybe there's confusion. Maybe there's fear and doubt. But friends, will we go beyond that? Will we allow the Holy Spirit to help us go beyond the fear and the doubt that plagues us? And will we say amen to God's yes? I agree. Lord, let it be. I agree. I align my life. I align all that I am, my belief system. I come into agreement, Lord, with the reality of who you are and the reality of your promises. I say amen.